Well, greetings everyone on this uh, snowy uh, night in Spokane and other areas. We've heard from some of you that have already uh, spoken up this evening. We are uh, very fortunate to have Dr. Gene Kiever, our speaker tonight. He is a professor of geology emeritus from Eastern Washington University. He's taught there for 45 years and he currently teaches uh, for senior colleges in Anacortes and Bellingham, Washington, over on the coast, for those of you that might be uh, zooming in from other parts of the country. Uh, he's going to be uh, talking about uh, the, uh, how science discovered the channel Scabland and, uh, tonight, and that you're in for a real treat uh, on this. Got a great uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, he studied uh, glacial history in the West and volcanic history of the Cascade Mountains. He's a founding member of the Ice Age Floods Institute, and he serves on that board. And he also is a member of the board of the Cheney Spokane chapter, which is affiliated with the Ice Age Floods Institute. He recently uh, co-authored on the trail of the Ice Age Floods book and also Washington Rocks. Those both are available on at the store on the IAFI.org website. So. Uh, on behalf of the Board of Directors, I present to you Dr. Gene Kiever. Well, thank you for joining me uh, this evening. And I'll be talking about uh, uh, basically uh, science uh, as used to discover the channeled scab lab. And so I'll be doing uh, a lot of history kind of stuff. So just to see how this whole thing uh, evolved. And uh, we'll find out that uh, basically uh, uh, Brett's, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, uh, he really was working with the um, scientific method in discovering uh, what he discovered. But he added a, a new twist and kind of got us uh, back in online. Oh, okay. I see. Okay, so there's lots of um, definitions that you can use for uh, science. And so you could go online, look up all kinds of things, and it gets kind of uh, complicated. And I sort of like this one best, that uh, it's knowledge that results in testable explanations about how the universe works. And a very important uh, part of this is you have to be able to test uh, whatever your hypothesis is uh, if you're trying to explain something, uh, you need to be able to uh, test that and prove it. If it's something that can't be tested, for example, if it uh, has something to do with uh, uh, be, uh, beliefs uh, areas, uh, then <clears throat> if you can get the test, but nobody's been successful yet in getting that. So some of the things that uh, we'll be looking at uh, tonight, I'm just going to do a real quick, uh, make sure that everybody knows what and where the channeled scab land is. And uh, then we've got some other things. Uh, uh, I'm going to show a little bit about the development of the geological sciences uh, and how did we develop our uh, geological method or our scientific method that we use uh, in the uh, earth sciences. And then, uh, of course, we have to get into something about catastrophism and something called the uniformitarianism. So we'll kind of uh, see how those two are related. And then we get into some other things. Before we can have the channel scablands, we've got to have a worldwide ice age. And that turns out to be one of the uh, big problems that we're facing in the 19th century uh, that geology needed to explain. And then we can look at uh, J. Harlan Bretz, and then we'll look at the a lot more detail on the channel scab land and a little bit of the uh, history uh, developing that. <clears throat> now, if you look at a raised relief map or um, of the state of Washington, uh, this is what it looks like, and. Uh, if you look at it carefully, uh, you can see that we're really a mountain state. And so uh, uh, low areas, flat areas, uh, there are uh, uh, not very many of them. Uh, so we're mostly uh, uh, looking at uh, 
mountainous structures. And so I'm sitting up here right now in Anacortes. Uh, so I got <coughs> a whole bunch of new geology that I've been working, <coughs> working on for the past 15, 16 <coughs> years that I've lived here. Uh, and so we have various mountains. We've got the coast ranges. Uh, we've got the Cascade Range, which is a big uh, system that really <coughs> divides the state in half. And then up in the northeastern part, we've got the northern Rocky Mountains, and we got a little bit of the Blue Mountains, and they extend down into Oregon, and they mark the southern boundary of what's left here, which is this big uh, flat looking area that we call the uh, uh, Columbia Plateau or Columbia Basin. <coughs> okay, so this is quite different. <coughs> and obviously it's got a different kind of <coughs> geology. And if we <coughs> look at what that geology is, <coughs> we can look at a cross section and see uh, kind of how the rocks are put together and the, uh, some of the other uh, features relative to the uh, uh, Columbia Plateau. So this could be going through Spokane, for example, going north up to Mount Spokane and, and so forth. Uh, and so it's just a very uh, uh, generalized uh, type of diagram, not really super accurate, but uh, it's just meant to show uh, what we have here. <clears throat> now, we have what we call the basement complex. And so this is uh, uh, crystalline uh, materials. These would be the granites and the uh, metamorphic rocks, things that have been under uh, pretty heavy metamorphic pressures and temperatures. And <clears throat> that's what makes up our mountains, including uh, step to Butte. So it's just a peaking out there uh, down to the south of Spokane. And then we have that in turn is covered up by the uh, channeled scab land. Okay, I'm sorry, by the uh, Columbia River basalt out here in this region here. Now this could, we, I'm gonna use this just as a uh, illustration of some of the general principles that we uh, follow. And uh, this all goes back to somebody called Nicholas uh, Steno uh, in the 17th century. And Steno was a biologist and then later on became a, uh, uh, went into church work and became the um, uh, bishop of, uh, um, what was it, Copenhagen. And so uh, he's uh, uh, up there in the, uh, uh, that part of the world. And some of the things that he came up with are the principles that we use today. Uh, for example, uh, <clears throat> uh, for centuries in the Christianity uh, religion, uh, fossils were not allowed, were not considered to be any evidence of life. Okay, so we had problems with that early on and uh, we need to, uh, uh, the fossils when we start dating rocks and so forth. So it was important that uh, he recognized that uh, fossils were really evidence of former life. <clears throat> Prior to that, the religious view was that uh, these were things that just grew in the rocks. And uh, sometimes you find some funny, funny shaped things in rocks and you say, oh yeah, well that's, uh, we call those uh, concretions. Uh, and some of them just happen to look exactly like uh, seashells and, and other kinds of, or bone. And so uh, he was uh, the first one uh, to really start pushing that, hey, this is not the way it works. But when we look at our diagram here, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, Steno recognized was the, what we call the law of super, superposition. Um, Geology, does, geology doesn't have very many laws. We're kind of lawless, <laughs> uh, envious of the physicists, you know, have all these definite things, you know, the apple is going to fall on your head and it's going to come down at a certain rate and so forth. So they got these things pretty well worked out. Uh, 
in geology, uh, we can't always be that precise. And the law of superposition says that uh, something, uh, for example, sitting on top of something else, okay, like the uh, Columbia River basalt here, it's got to be younger than the uh, basement complex. And so each layer of lava that you see there is uh, younger. The youngest one is on top and one underneath is older and so forth. <clears throat> so very simple kind of concept and uh, it's the base basics of trying to unravel geology in uh, many areas. And then <clears throat> there's the principle of cross-cutting uh, relationships. And so, uh, for example, if we look here in the channeled uh, Scabland area, you see something called the Luss Hills. And Luss is a windblown uh, sediment, dust uh, sort of size, very uh, fine materials, and uh, the area was at one time covered completely by this windblown silt. And yet we see when we look over by the channels of Scablin on this diagram that uh, the, there doesn't seem to be any loss there. So this is a cross-cutting uh, situation that something has removed that. And so uh, therefore the uh, erosion in this case that took place must be younger than the uh, windblown silts and of course the basalt and the uh, crystalline uh, rocks underneath. Okay, now so when we look at this, um, for example, the Columbia River basalt and as probably most of you are quite aware, uh, this was uh, uh, a very really, uh, well, I'll, I guess I can't say catastrophic, but a very huge event uh, that involved very fluid lavas coming out uh, roughly 15, 16 million years ago for 90% of the uh, Columbia River basalts came out at that time. And you can see the extent of the uh, basalts uh, covers something like 64,000 square miles. So it's a huge, huge area. Uh, some of that basalt was uh, fluid enough uh, that it flowed through the Columbia Gorge uh, up to Vancouver, Washington, down on the uh, Oregon coast. And also when we think of Steno's law of the cross-cutting relationships, if we look in this uh, upper right-hand side, uh, upper left-hand side, sorry, uh, <clears throat> you can see the layers of lava that are coming out here and cutting through those, uh, we have a dike. And so that dike must be younger than the uh, layers of lava that it cuts through. Okay, and of course, new lava is coming out in this particular diagram. Uh, so that's gonna be uh, even younger. And eventually that dike will get buried by another lava flow. And therefore that lava flow will be younger uh, than, the, than the dike. <clears throat> and not, don't confuse this, this is somewhat like what's going on in Hawaii now and particularly in 2018, uh, where we have a, a curtain of fire opens up and huge volumes of lava come out in Hawaii. They come out initially uh, and then they sort of putter out uh, uh, and uh, the volumes uh, decrease. Uh, in the case of the Columbia River basalts, uh, we're talking about hundreds of cubic miles uh, during, of one, during one eruption. And this stuff, it doesn't form a volcano. Okay, so it's not like uh, Hawaii where you actually have a central vent, <clears throat> but these uh, fissures that open up maybe 20, 30, 40 miles long. And so you don't have one central uh, place where the lavas are gonna come through. <clears throat> okay, and then of course, on top of that, we have the uh, windblown silts, the windblown uh, materials uh, during uh, drier uh, intervals. And actually, particularly right after uh, uh, channeled Scavaland flood, 
Uh, we're going to have a lot of sediment. Uh, we're destroying whatever vegetation is there. And so there's going to be a lot of dust blowing around uh, after such an event. <clears throat> so on our little diagram, this would be uh, the LUS uh, blanket that's uh, being laid down and it's still on the move. <clears throat> Uh, one of the best places to look at that uh, windblown silt, of course, is go down to the uh, southeastern part of the state over into the Palouse itself, uh, Pullman area. Uh, this is um, on top of uh, Stepto Butte uh, taking this particular picture. And uh, interestingly, uh, uh, our farming techniques here, uh, which nobody seems to be doing uh, too much about, are, are very destructive to the topsoils here. Uh, our uh, loss per acre is somewhere around uh, 15, 16 tons of uh, topsoil per year uh, because of wind and rain erosion and so forth. <clears throat> and so, yeah, the farming just encourages that kind of thing. Okay. <coughs> <clears throat> when we look at the uh, <clears throat> Columbia Plateau, though, and we start looking at some of the details, uh, certainly if you go down into the true Palouse over in that southeastern part of the state, floods never got there. And so that's an undisturbed uh, section of this windblown silt. But if you go out into the uh, Channel Scamland, this is the kind of thing you see looking from the air. <clears throat> you can see uh, uh, what we call Lus Islands. And so these are areas that uh, sh show up quite nicely here. These are areas that, uh, uh, talking to some of the farmers down there, and uh, hey, you, you, depending on uh, what kind of crops they get, uh, you might have to pay $800,000, $1,200 an acre for that stuff. Uh, because you can still grow crops on it. Uh, if you move over to the right-hand side there where you get out of those Lus Islands, you can see that uh, here we're down to the bare uh, basalt or very, very thin soils. Um, <clears throat> when I bought my little Scabland tract uh, south of Cheney there, uh, I talked to one of the uh, uh, ranchers there and he said, well, that's worth $150 an acre. Uh, but then these very wealthy uh, uh, college professors came in and they, uh, they upped the prices. <laughs> okay, but when you look at the uh, um, channeled scab land itself, it's, uh, it's a confusing mess when you look at it. Uh, you've got some places, uh, well, you've got mesas, you've got buttes, uh, remnants of lava flows. And so if you take that top flow, uh, you just extend it over, it connects with the other flows. It's just everything in between is gone. And it's a very, very confused, irregular topography. Occasionally you'll have deep gouges. And uh, Professor McCollum will be talking about that uh, uh, in April, so you want to catch that one because she's going to talk about why that area is so special and why we have so many deep uh, uh, troughs that have been cut into this, uh, particularly the northern part of the uh, Channel Scabland in the Cheney Palouse Track. Uh, Rock Lake uh, is the deepest lake in the uh, uh, Channel Scabland. Uh, the deepest part is 400 feet. So a uh, pretty remarkable uh, uh, situation. <clears throat> okay, now, of course, uh, we're gonna come, I'm just gonna reintroduce here, Jay Harlan Bretz, uh, and he publishes his paper on this debacle of floodwater forming the channel Scablin. Well, needless to say, this didn't go over very well uh, initially. And uh, it took them a few uh, decades to get this thing worked out. Uh, the uh, uh, result was that uh, sort of almost universally uh, 
described as this is outrageous hypothesis. Uh, this uh, just can't be. So <clears throat> for some reason, people weren't really willing to try to accept uh, his ideas. And so I thought it would be a good idea uh, to look at a little bit of the history of uh, the uh, geological thought, how things work. Uh, and so why was this thing not uh, even seriously considered uh, uh, when Brett's first uh, 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 suggested it? <clears throat> and so we got to look a little bit at uh, uh, what's this modern geological science and uh, what is this uh, uh, scientific uh, um, method? And of course, like all sciences, there's uh, science is made of debate of, uh, oh, I don't agree with that. And uh, I'm going to find proof, you know, one way or the other, and we're gonna test your hypothesis. And so some of the controversies that we had was, of course, just establishing the modern geological thinking. Uh, and uh, then there was another problem that came up about the time we got thinking on the same page uh, then somebody suggested there was an ice age. And so there was more controversy going on. And of course, in the early 1900s, uh, we have <coughs> Brett's coming in. And so even more controversy. So <coughs> when we look at the <coughs> problems that uh, had to be overcome, initially, uh, really one of the problems was uh, working with time. And so there wasn't sufficient time uh, for um, uh, anything that uh, slow processes to operate. And therefore, you know, we're gonna have to have something happen very, very fast. And so catastrophism was just the accepted way. And uh, of course we had to follow, uh, particularly for a few centuries, uh, the, the Bible was considered to be, have all the answers that you ever needed to know. And so uh, we had the biblical kind of uh, um, cap on what, uh, what kind of thought process, process could take place. <clears throat> and of course, uh, one of the aspects of that is we've got to have a worldwide flood. So, um, in other words, uh, these are some of the, the artwork. You can get all kinds of artwork about this amazing flood that took place. Uh, Noah's flood, of course, so we're into the, um, <clears throat> those ideas. Oh, let's back up here. And so uh, uh, this is uh, uh, something I borrowed from uh, Vic Baker. And uh, he points out that uh, uh, in 1690, uh, <clears throat> this book on geology uh, about how the earth formed, uh, even in the Bible, there's a couple different conflicts uh, or, uh, or a conflict in terms of the flood. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, did the water come out of the caves and out of the ground or did it come from the sky uh, it's in uh, both uh, explanations are in the um, <clears throat> in the Bible, and Warren in this case uh, he picked the uh, uh, subterranean caverns. So there was a lot of mystery about caves and what was down there, and presumably there was uh, amazing amounts of water that could uh, gush forth uh, to cause the uh, big flood. <clears throat> okay, now the other, <clears throat> one of the other things was the time and the layering of the rocks. How did all this take place? As far as time, uh, the Archbishop of, uh, uh, let's see, I guess, uh, Ireland, and uh, he, uh, uh, James Usher, and he counted up this is the annals uh, I think uh, what for from the beginning of the of the world and so he used the bible to establish that uh, the earth began in 4004 BC okay so that 
allows you know a little more than 5,000 years for th everything to take place. Uh, you know, if you're going to create a mountain range and erode it down to nothing, uh, you only have 5,000 years to do that. You know, so it's got to it's got to happen fast. So you've got to have some catastrophic uh, kinds of explanations. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, the uh, John Lightfoot, uh, he said, well, I'm gonna recheck your information and which he did. And so we went back through the Bible and the begots, begats, all that, and uh, six days to create the earth. And so he came up with uh, uh, 4004 BC, uh, October 23rd at 9 a.m. So this is pretty precise. Uh, most geology, we can't uh, get that precise when we uh, try to uh, date things. So kind of ushers in the dark ages of geology. So uh, catastrophism must be part of the story according to uh, the folks in the 17th century. <clears throat> Okay, now another, uh, uh, actually uh, professor of mineralogy in Germany, uh, he, Abraham Gottlieb Werner, and so he comes up with some ideas uh, about the layering of the rocks. And he said, well, you know, he suggests that uh, we, there was a universal ocean. And so the earth was formed. Uh, we had water everywhere. The water is going to evaporate, it's gonna become clouds. And uh, since he's uh, sort of a chemist kind of guy and uh, the materials that are dissolved in the water are gonna come out. And so the first thing that happens according to Werner is uh, granite uh, comes out. And so what he's doing, he's explaining uh, the geology that he sees in his native uh, Germany. <clears throat> then the next thing comes out is uh, maybe sandstone and then, oh, some shaley uh, kind of material somehow come out of this universal ocean. And so there was a big debate between these Nept Neptunists and uh, later on the uh, uh, people who wanted slower processes. <clears throat> uh, another person who um, uh, sort of fit into <clears throat> the prevailing theories at the time. Uh, now, uh, Georges uh, Couvert, uh, he's uh, actually a pretty good uh, uh, paleontologist and he's studying fossils and, <clears throat> and he's studying them in layers in the Paris uh, basin. And so he recognizes that, you know, the kinds of fossils that I find on uh, in the younger layers uh, are completely different. And some of the ones that were in the older layers, they're no longer there, they're extinct. And so how did these things become extinct? Uh, well, we had some sort of great upheaval or catastrophes, floods, and so forth. <coughs> so again, <coughs> cat catastrophe uh, moves in again. Okay, now things change around. Uh, starting with a uh, Scottish uh, um, gentleman who uh, comes up, uh, he's a great observer. And so he observes things. One of the things that really, uh, <clears throat> as he looks at some of the rock layers and uh, uh, the cliffs around uh, uh, Scotland, uh, he sees rocks that have been uh, tipped up almost uh, vertically. They've been eroded off and then flat layers of uh, sedimentary rocks have been deposited on top. This is what we call an angular unconformity. And so that this can't happen very fast. And so that <clears throat> he comes up with this uh, concept of deep time. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Hutton's uh, treatise on the uh, theory of the earth <clears throat> is 2,138 pages long, uh, very poorly written. And so it probably would have just got uh, uh, lost somewhere in some library. <clears throat> but a friend of his from the University of Edinburgh, uh, John Playfair, uh, he kind of does, uh, 
it's not quite the um, uh, quite uh, what really it's not a kid's book, uh, but it's uh, illustrations of Newtonian Huto theory of the Earth, and uh, in a very much more acceptable fashion. So people could read it, understand it. And uh, he also uses the phrase, the present is the key to the past. And so that was sort of the, uh, it still is <coughs> uh, in geology, but we do recognize there are, can be some other uh, things going on. So the idea then um, is uh, reinforced by uh, Charles Lyell, who's a British uh, person who uh, uh, puts out the first uh, textbook in geology, Principles of Geology, uh, in 1830, and he introduces this term uniformitarianism. And so the whole idea now is that everything is produced by very gradual processes and processes that are operating today on the face of the earth. And of course that gets um, Brett's into trouble a little bit uh, later. <clears throat> now, further development, um, <clears throat> Charles Darwin on the Beagle expedition uh, in 1831, 1836, turns out that the uh, captain of the ship has a copy of uh, Lyell's Principle of Geology. And so he lends it to uh, Darwin who reads it uh, cover to cover, very impressed and uses those uh, techniques and ideas as he makes observations. Darwin is really a naturalist. And of course his big contribution was the idea of the evolution and you needed deep time uh, for those processes to take place. So things are starting to switch around now. We're going more into a real true science and the idea of uniformitarianism, uh, it wins, it's big, uh, it really takes over. Uh, catastrophism then is sort of gone from the geological thinking uh, at uh, uh, this time. <clears throat> now, another thing that has to happen, so 1830, we got uh, pretty much uh, uh, thinking in, in terms of modern kinds of thoughts, uh, but then we start getting some other problems. Uh, somebody starts suggesting that there was an ice age. And so <clears throat> how does this take place? Well, it starts in Switzerland and very logically, uh, uh, Ignaz Benetz is, uh, he's an engineer <clears throat> and interesting, uh, his engineering uh, job was they had lakes that were suddenly breaking out in the Alps and flooding down into towns and, and uh, villages and so forth. And so he has to try to figure out what's going on and, and how, how, can you, uh, how can they deal with this uh, in terms of uh, engineering. So <clears throat> he looks at the glaciers uh, in, coming out of the Alps and he recognizes that uh, there's these lumps, these big uh, mounds of debris that are formed at the margin of the ice. These are what we call moraines. And there's a series of these and they go way out uh, some distance uh, from uh, the present day or what were present day glaciers then. And so, uh, and these were holding in lakes and those lakes uh, uh, would, uh, break through those uh, uh, moraine dams occasionally and uh, be causing some of the uh, problems. But <clears throat> this also recognized that, okay, glaciers were more extensive in the Alpine regions. Oop, let me go back here. And <clears throat> then some other uh, geologists, not geologists, uh, actually uh, botanists uh, come, came up with some ideas, uh, Bernhardi and Schimper in Germany, uh, they're studying lichens and mosses. And so they're looking at uh, rocks and uh, 
Schimper kind of and, and Bernardi, and they're looking at these rocks. They say, you know, these rocks are not found in Germany. What are these big rocks doing here? And so uh, Schimper comes up with the idea of uh, uh, worldwide uh, glaciation, and he uses the term in 1837 of ice site. And so this is ice time or ice age. So <clears throat> the next development uh, is that uh, Louis Agassiz, uh, he's a Swiss paleontologist, and uh, he comes up with this uh, concept that there was a worldwide ice age. And so, uh, and he actually publishes a book on glaciers in 1840. And so he's really pushing this idea of ice age, uh, a big ice age. And this is not widely accepted by the science scientists of the day. So more debate going on. And, and I guess uh, that's what science is all about. We're continually debating things, trying to find the better answer or the best answer for whatever problem we're trying to uh, uh, solve. Now, fortunately, <clears throat> Agassiz, he's invited to the United States. Uh, so he goes over in 1846 uh, to uh, be a lecturer at, at Harvard. And uh, he works also, uh, uh, one of his, uh, his big areas is fossil fishes. And so he's working on uh, those kind of things, but he arrives in uh, North America and <clears throat> uh, up in New England. And so uh, he's looking around and he starts seeing some of the same things uh, that he saw in Europe finds these big rocks. Uh, this one uh, over in the upper left-hand side uh, is about a mile from where I live. And uh, interesting, this is a granite and there is no granite uh, to the north of us uh, that could have been brought there by a glacier. Uh, it would have been brought from British Columbia. And so these are uh, glacial erratics. These are things that tell us that uh, these out of place rocks, they got there somehow and glaciers are really one of the best ways to explain most of these. And we also get the uh, <clears throat> polished rock and striations and grooves and so forth. <clears throat> <clears throat> Meanwhile, back in Europe, uh, the British in particular, uh, since uh, you know, you're never a more than a few miles, a few tens of miles from the ocean, uh, they want icebergs. They want uh, uh, to explain the features that you, uh, are seen in Europe. Uh, they want uh, just higher sea levels, icebergs coming in, and everything can be explained by icebergs. And so they are debating back in Europe very uh, actively in the United States, our geologists have no, uh, um, they're not locked to that. And so uh, we could see that, you know, in our Alpine glaciers, we see, yeah, there's moraines, uh, there's ice that's uh, retreating behind, in some cases <coughs> has disappeared many miles. Uh, if you go into the uh, Great Lakes area, for example, <clears throat> you can see the upper right-hand side, we've got uh, a real uh, involved system of moraines. And so these pretty much outline where a big glacier had formerly been. And that glacier could only come from uh, uh, Canada to the north and the Canadian Shield. And so this is definite proof of uh, continental ice. And so uh, everything was uh, uh, fitting into place. So we're starting to uh, <clears throat> get all our um, th uh, ideas in a row. 
And then uh, this uh, new upstart comes in, uh, Harley Bretz. And so Harley uh, was born in 1882 and uh, uh, in Michigan. And he goes to a religious college, uh, Albion College, <coughs> where he liked to do uh, uh, lots of practical jokes. And so there was a whole gang of them that uh, were very active. So he had a good, he has a good, had a good sense of humor and so forth. And <clears throat> so one of his, uh, so he graduates, uh, graduated from Albion. And so he takes a teaching position and that brings him out to Seattle, Washington. And so <clears throat> um, here he is 1908 to 1910. And so uh, very active, very uh, uh, energetic guy. And so Brett's uh, decides, well, <clears throat> he immediately gets a boat and uh, he and his wife, Fanny, uh, they take this boat out uh, wherever, whenever they can into Puget Sound. And he's looking at all the uh, layers of rock and well, or sediment, there's no rock down there. It's all loose sediment because it's all glacial deposits. <clears throat> so he's teaching at Franklin High School uh, in Seattle, and um, <clears throat> he actually puts together <clears throat> the story of Puget Sound, and it becomes uh, bulletin number eight of the Washington Geological Survey. So he's worked out the whole story of the glacial history in Puget Sound, <clears throat> in his two, three year uh, stay in, in Seattle. So he goes on to the University of Chicago and he's gonna be there for, from 1911 to 1913. Uh, now sometime within this uh, period of time, Harley Bretz said, you know, that doesn't sound very professional, Harley Bretz, you know, kind of, uh, oh, but, so he decided that he was going to be J. Harlan Bretz. And so on uh, his PhD thesis, uh, it was approved by his committee. He took it down to the registrar's office and he added the J in front of the Harlan uh, Bretz. And so uh, interestingly, there's no period there. And so, uh, <laughs> I think he maybe he did it as a joke, but I know every time I write something and you send it in and then the editor gets hold of it, it comes back and the J has a period after it. And so you have to write back and say, no, 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 you know, you got to take that period out. Uh, so uh, uh, he was uh, having fun. Now his next uh, job is at the University of Washington. So he only spends a couple of years uh, at the University of Washington. <clears throat> he uh, had some conflicts with some of the uh, uh, ge uh, geology uh, uh, staff there, professors. Uh, they were kind of uh, old school and they didn't think that uh, field work was that important. You could uh, sit back in your uh, uh, rocking chair and you can work out a lot of things or you can send out graduate students and uh, you can put together stories of all sorts of uh, geological phenomena. And so um, uh, Brett's didn't get along very well. So he ended up going back to the University of Chicago and he stayed there for the rest of his uh, career. And uh, he's gonna pass away in 1981 so maybe uh, being uh, obstinate or whatever it is, uh, he lasted, he lived for 99 years. <clears throat> so Brett was in the field work, very energetic. Um, <clears throat> a few decades ago, I was on a field trip and I wish I had written down the fellow's name, uh, <clears throat> but we were talking about the, uh, uh, Bretts, or, or, or the guy was from, that's right, he graduated from the University of Chicago, 
And he said, well, yeah, he's one of Brett's students. And so, oh, so I <laughs> tried to get all as much information as I could. And he said, well, yeah, he said, uh, uh, oh, he, yeah, he was a slave driver. He'd be out in the field uh, mapping rocks and doing all that, go back to camp, have dinner. <clears throat> then Brett's would say, hey, there's a cave nearby here. Let's all go into the cave. And so he dragged these uh, graduate students into a cave and uh, they'd look at limestone caves and he's taking notes and, and actually uh, that's his second expertise. He has some very uh, um, uh, original papers and original ideas on how limestone caverns form. <clears throat> Now, when Bretz was at the University of Washington, he, these new, we had no topographic, or basically no topographic maps uh, of the surface of the earth, uh, particularly in the Western United States. And so uh, there was an effort by the US Geological Survey then to uh, develop these topographic maps. And one of them came in and it caught, uh, <clears throat> into the University of Washington and caught Brett's eye. And it's shown in that lower uh, uh, right-hand side. Uh, this is the uh, potholes area over in the um, Quincy Basin. And he looked at that and he said, well, that looks like a couple of waterfalls. What are, what are waterfalls doing in the middle of Washington state? And of course the uh, waterfalls are leading down to the Columbia River in the uh, background. So this was very intriguing and he never uh, forgot that. And <clears throat> later on, of course, when he came out in the 1920s doing his studies, uh, he looked at uh, uh, this area, thought, I gotta look at that more closely as well as some other things that had uh, uh, garnered his attention. And if you look at the Quincy Basin, okay, it, uh, you can see the, well, I can't find my, well, oh, it's okay. Um, looking for my cursor, have lost it, that's okay. Uh, the um, Quincy Basin is on the lower end of the Grand Coulee. And so the Grand Coulee dumps into the uh, Quincy Basin. <clears throat> and so when he looked at this, uh, this is one of Bruce's um, illustrations here, Bruce Bornstead. If you're not familiar with him, you gotta go online and <clears throat> check Bruce out. It's one of my graduate students. <laughs> and uh, so he looks at Potholes Cooley and then he finds another coulee, Frenchman coulee. And so these are both at 1200 foot elevation. He said, well, how could that be? If we got water going through potholes coulee, we must also have water going over Frenchman coulee. So there must be enough water uh, filling that uh, Quincy Basin. <clears throat> and if you, when you drive uh, uh, Interstate 90 to the west, uh, you know, you come down off the Palouse Slope to Moses Cooley, and then you go across the Quincy Basin, and then you get to Frenchman Hills, and then uh, you go down to Vantage, and, and uh, so that's a route that uh, uh, many of us uh, have taken. And there's other ways out of that Quincy Basin, the Drumheller Channels, uh, and then that means there's a pathway uh, that's gonna go between the Frenchman Hills, Saddle Mountains, and then the Othello Channels, that takes you down into the uh, uh, Pasco Basin. So uh, he starts seeing all these uh, interconnections. So <coughs> uh, <coughs> Brett starts coming out, uh, very intrigued with the area. And so he comes in the uh, uh, 1920s through about 1927. And uh, he uh, borrows a car and then eventually has his own car. And um, uh, 
uh, they go doing various kinds of uh, geological studies. Now, fortunately, if you look at the lower uh, <clears throat> right-hand diagram, uh, these are the Washington railroads in 1910. And so there's not very many roads. So he doesn't have a lot of roads and not very good roads, uh, but the railroad is there. So all he has to do is get to uh, a railroad stop and then he and his students can walk the railroad tracks, <clears throat> looking at railroad cuts, uh, looking at the geology alongside. And he starts putting together uh, <clears throat> a story about uh, what caused the uh, topography, what caused the, uh, the situation that he's looking at. <clears throat> so we got the Washington Central, the Great Northern, the Northern Pacific, M Milwaukee. Uh, we've got all these major railroads that are uh, running through the Channel Scamlet. So he uses railroad uh, uh, access in many places to um, uh, develop his ideas. <clears throat> and uh, borrowed this from uh, uh, Gary Ford and uh, find it very intriguing and uh, uh, that Brett's would come out and you notice the photographs taken <clears throat> by somebody named Thomas Large. Now Large is a high school teacher uh, at Lewis and Clark High School in Spokane. And so Brett's and students would come out every year uh, to the Spokane area. Uh, Large would make sure that he got, uh, I guess, lent him or made sure he got access to a vehicle. Uh, and I don't know, some, anybody older than me, I don't know if that's the Model A or the Model T. I think it's Model A, but uh, at any rate, that was the field vehicle uh, that he would use. <clears throat> so uh, if anyone has information on Thomas Large, I think it'd be a terrific history project to find out more. And maybe Lewis and Clark High School has uh, information about it. But uh, uh, he very much encouraged uh, Brett's and there's some uh, thought that maybe uh, the idea of the floods came from <coughs> one of the um, uh, high school teacher teachers at uh, Lewis and Clark. <coughs> but uh, we, Gary checked with uh, Vic Baker and uh, nobody seems to have much in the way of information. So Brett's is out there in the field and now he's got his spanking new uh, Dodge four, so he's uh, uh, using whatever roads and so forth, putting together uh, the story of the uh, Ice Age floods, basically. <clears throat> so he sees all the evidence, the uh, scoured uh, bedrock, the uh, Lus Hills, the uh, huge uh, waterfalls, dry falls, uh, twice as uh, tall as uh, um, Niagara Falls. And so he's seeing all this kind of information and he puts it together in a map, 1925. And so this is his map and he pretty much has the picture. <clears throat> so we'll compare this uh, with some of the more modern uh, maps later, but it's basically, uh, they're all the same. Uh, he pretty much got it right in most uh, situations, a little here and there, uh, add and subtract a few things, but uh, uh, looks pretty good. And so uh, then we might say, well, what did this uh, flood look like? And if um, anyone is not familiar with Nick Zenter, Nick is just a, a great guy. And he has uh, YouTubes that uh, you'll, you'll spend uh, the next six months uh, watching them all. And if you're gonna pay attention to all the things that he has to offer, uh, but you can go on there and look at the uh, one on the Grand Coulee. Oh, come back here. And so, 
got to get this up. We don't want to watch it all, but the part that's uh, really fun, I think, we'll let Nick take over from here. Across Eastern Washington. 15,000 years ago, there was a waterfall here, but not like the waterfall that you have in your mind, perhaps. Here on the lip of Dry Falls, there was more than 350 feet of water moving 65 miles an hour over this cliff. This is water from a bursting ice dam 170 miles away in Idaho that ripped through central Washington. A wall of water that dwarfed the local landscape with the energy of 10 times the power of all the world's rivers combined. An ice age flood with water, rock, soil, and icebergs three and a half miles wide on a thundering journey to the Pacific Ocean. Okay. So, tries to give you some idea or feel. Crack the no, mystery. No, no, quiet, Nick. <laughs> Well, let me go back. And the thing that blows you away when you start uh, studying the uh, channeled scab line, and it takes a while because you got to get that geography down. And <clears throat> so, you know, I've done quite a bit of research in the uh, area in the Chini Palouse and other areas uh, in the scab land, uh, but. Uh, the idea that Grand Coulee has got that kind of flow of water, but then, uh, I can, oh, there's that cursor. Okay, but when you look at, okay, you've got another scab land track over here. So as it's the water is going down Grand Coulee, there's huge floods of water going down here that look pretty much the same. There's huge floods of water coming down the Cheney Palouse scab land track. And so it, this is all happening and the big floods is happening simultaneously. So take that small picture from uh, the Grand Coulee and put it all across, um, you know, 90 mile wide zone that's being affected by these <clears throat> amazing floods. Okay, uh, the upper, this upper diagram here is in the upper right is uh, if you were up 450 miles and look down and this is the kind of view that you would see, you can see that pretty much looks like uh, um, Brett's map. And if you get the Ice Age Floods Institute map, which you can get from the bookstore, uh, it pretty much uh, shows exactly what uh, uh, Brett's had in 1925. So amazing, amazing bit of uh, uh, field research. Now, of course, <clears throat> we still were convinced, but uh, the folks back in 1927 weren't, and they had a meeting and what it was it was a trap there were a number of people who had alternate ideas and they wanted to present them and <clears throat> they poo-pooed uh, uh, Brett's ideas uh, very strongly you know various things impossible and wholly inadequate and <clears throat> probably I don't think it was ever said but it was also a return to catastrophism and so uh, because of our early history, <clears throat> that probably uh, was partially uh, pushing that. Now at that meeting, uh, there was a fellow uh, sitting in the audience, uh, Joseph Pardee, and he's a geologist uh, for the US uh, Geological Survey. And it's reported that he leaned over to his, uh, somebody sitting next to him and he said, I know where Brett's water came from. Okay, so that was the big question. Where did you get this water? Where did it all come from, uh, Dr. Brett's? And 
Brett's had no idea, but there was somebody in the audience who had uh, a suspicion. Uh, one of the problems was that uh, Pardee, his boss, uh, James Galuli, was one of the guys up there uh, kind of uh, uh, putting down Brett's as far as uh, um, the idea of a, a giant flood. So he didn't say anything. Not out loud too. However, later on, Pardee, uh, he's working in the uh, Missoula Basin and uh, another geologist comes through and he points out to uh, Pardee, Pardee's a mining geologist, so he's not uh, too interested. He is interested in, in all sorts of things, but he's really interested in the mining and uh, so uh, uh, this professor came out and he points out, he says, see those lines on the hills? Okay, those are old strain lines, wave cut benches. And uh, this photograph in the upper right is just uh, priceless because it's got just enough snow and enough melting that you can see those nice little uh, uh, terrace-like features. And those are former shore line, uh, shorelines. And those shorelines go up to 4,200 feet in uh, elevation. This is still in uh, Missoula, Montana, uh, photo taken by Bernie Lyonsberger. And <clears throat> that means that Missoula, Montana is under a thousand feet of water. And if you look at one of Bruce's uh, uh, illustrations here of uh, Mount Jumbo, you can see the extent of the water in the background. It's everywhere you can see, uh, there's a huge lake sitting in here. So now we're starting to get the uh, potential for a huge volume. Now Pardee was concerned. He said, well, uh, so you got a big lake but how do I know that it came out uh, catastrophically? Well, in his uh, findings, uh, 1940, he presented a paper, uh, an oral paper, talking about what he called giant current ripples. And so he had discovered an area uh, in the Camas Prairie. Uh, this is sort of uh, between Flathead uh, uh, Lake area and the little Bitterroot uh, um, drainage system where uh, Marco Pass leads over and uh, floods down. Uh, you can see where the former lake levels are. So you're gonna drain that amount of water. If you pull the plug on the lower end of the lake, uh, that water would come out and race through here uh, at very high velocity. And so you end up with these uh, roller coaster looking hills. And <clears throat> what these are, are uh, enlargements of what we see on uh, beaches and uh, uh, in stream beds and so forth, where sand is moved by currents and forms this very nice pattern. But the size of these ripples is quite uh, uh, different. Uh, so uh, you can see some farm buildings there in the uh, background, give you some idea how big those things are. And all that water is going to race through this pass and head on down to the south. And so uh, I was fortunate enough uh, as a graduate student, because uh, I could never afford to go on this trip, but uh, my major professor said, hey, we need somebody to drive a vehicle. Uh, and uh, we've got the international quaternary uh, meetings in Denver. And so I'm in, in Wyoming at this point and 1965. And so I got to uh, tour the uh, West, basically looking at features, some of which uh, were the Ice Age floods features. And so here we are uh, over in the, uh, just below Markle Pass, and we're looking at some of those ridges 
and looking at the sediment that's in there. So these are not uh, sand deposits. These are big rocks, various kinds of rocky stuff. Uh, there's a lot of energy here. And so as a result of that, uh, our leader who's John Montaigne uh, was leading this uh, particular trip. Uh, he came around with a piece of paper uh, one evening and uh, said, uh, hey, you wanna sign this one? And I said, sure, you know. <laughs> and so uh, we, we all basically, these are geologists from all over the world, Germany, Norway, the Nether, uh, Netherlands, uh, somebody from New Zealand, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, uh, they sent a telegraph to Bretz and said, we are all now catastrophists. <clears throat> so one of the things that we do <clears throat> is we have a, uh, the Ice Age Flood is Institute uh, we have uh, uh, field trips, and particularly in the fall, we have one that's uh, sort of a, a big one, and uh, all of the members and others can sign up for the field trip, and we got to go 2016. It was in Missoula, Montana, uh, so we're walking through these uh, uh, giant current dunes or giant current ripples, okay, and you can see how big they are. They're uh, three, four stories high, uh, very, very impressive uh, features to look at. However, once they were recognized uh, in Montana, <clears throat> we found, particularly as we had air photos, uh, the West Plains and Spokane is just loaded with these uh, ripples. They're not e as easy to see as these big ones. Uh, but on your way, Interstate 90, you go by the airport uh, over to the Cheney exit, and you're going through a whole series of ripples. And again, they're not very tall. They're only uh, eight, uh, eight feet or so, and then they're spaced out 150 feet or so, and then there's another one. <clears throat> so most people just uh, <clears throat> pass them by, don't notice them. If you want to go out to... Uh, uh, Airway Heights and go over, uh, uh, turn north on Rambo Road, you'll go through a series of ripples that are uh, very easy to see. Uh, uh, again, in my Washington Rocks, this is a picture from my Washington Rocks book. Okay, <clears throat> so now we got the picture. We got an ice dam uh, up there in the Sandpoint uh, uh, Lake Ponderé area. And that ice dam is blocking the drainage, uh, the Clark Fork drainage. We got a huge lake that forms in Montana. And uh, that ice dam will break loose and head down the Ratham Prairie into uh, uh, the Eastern Washington area. And you can see where the scab lands are here. <clears throat> Okay, so what did this uh, look like? There's sort of a uh, thing, I think it's on the Ice Age Floods Institute. Uh, so if you wanna go back and look at this sometime, uh, <clears throat> it's not the best uh, reproduction of what went on, but it does give you the feeling of what's happening. Here comes the ice coming down, uh, the big continental ice sheet, uh, it's heading down into the Puget Sound area. And so we're gonna block off the Clark Fork River and we're gonna generate then the uh, Glacial Lake Missoula. We're gonna start backing that water up. <clears throat> it's gonna go almost to, uh, well, it does go to Flathead Lake actually, where Flathead Lake is today. Uh, goes up the uh, Bitterroot so it's going almost to Glacier National Park. And so you have this monster lake. And so you've got uh, uh, 550 cubic miles of water 
held in by this ice plug. And so the ice is going to uh, occasionally break off. And we think this has happened uh, a number of times. And so the water is going to go uh, scooting out of there pretty fast. It's going to affect the areas up in uh, northeastern Washington. And of course, the big flow is going to be <clears throat> down through the Rathrum. And this is going to happen very fast. Again, the uh, uh, computer aspects to this uh, graphics are a little bit slow in having getting the feeling for what's happening here, but I think it gives you just a very general overview that as that water is coming out uh, and it's going to be spilling then across the eastern Washington landscape. And so we'll be cutting all the coolies, channels, and so forth. Uh, we're going to have temporary uh, uh, backups, uh, like getting through Wallula Gap. Uh, so we're going to have uh, a temporary lake that's going to form in there. And similarly, as the uh, water is heading down through the uh, Columbia Gorge, the water is going to back up almost to Yakima. And so it's going to be roaring through. Again, uh, some of the work that's been done suggests that uh, going through the Columbia Gorge, we could have 80 mile an hour um, <clears throat> flow of currents, more back up in the Willamette Valley, and then finally uh, shooting out into the Pacific. Okay, so. Uh, again, uh, in Spokane in the early 1990s, uh, Dale Stradling and I were invited to, uh, and really a fellow by the name of Paul Weiss, uh, put together a um, meeting in which got representatives from the Forest Service and the um, Bureau of Land Management, government agencies, and uh, USGS, of course. And so it was there that we decided that the best way to try to tell this story uh, is to have a, pri uh, a private, a non-governmental uh, group form. And so this is where the Ice Age Floods Institute was uh, generated. <clears throat> and that's our logo down there in the lower uh, right. And it helped, and so we could, uh, government workers cannot communicate with their representatives, senators, and Congress people, and so forth, unless they're asked, uh, you know, as uh, officially. And so we as private citizens, though, could, uh, could work on our local representatives uh, to try to <clears throat> get the idea across that uh, we need an Ice Age Floods uh, National Trail. Smithsonian came, came up with the 2009 uh, with the 10 most uh, uh, top natural wonders and Ice Age Trail is uh, one of those. And so we had uh, really a bipartisan uh, uh, effort going on, Marie Cantwell in the uh, Senate and uh, Doc um, oh, what's the name, Doc? Yeah, can't think of it. Uh, at any rate, he's uh, in the Congress, in the House, and uh, uh, they both put together the same, um, submitted the same bill. And so when it passed both houses, it immediately, uh, there was no conference committee or anything like that. And so it immediately became law and after it was signed by Obama. So we're working on a trail sort of like the Lewis and Clark Trail. The National Park Service now has uh, a logo that they're going to put on the um, some of the highways that are going to depict uh, the main um, uh, Ice Age floods uh, 
National Geologic Trail. It'll be going right uh, uh, through Spokane or on uh, Interstate 90 anyways. And so the local uh, uh, chapters will have to uh, find ways to divert people so they can, we can show off some of our great things that we have here. So uh, anyway, uh, that's my presentation. Any questions uh, be very welcome. There's nothing in the chat right now. So ah. if uh, you have a question for Dr. Kiefer, feel free to unmute, identify yourself and ask your question. Is that the question? When I might have did, missed. It says, what year do you do they think the Missoula flood was? Okay. Uh, between about 18,000 and 15,000, maybe 14,000 something. Uh, we've got a uh, site on the West Plains uh, with the Mount St. Helens ash and that uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, came after some of the floods. And so we're able to uh, tell that it's um, about 15,000 years. And there's some other dates too as well. So it's 18,000 to 15,000 would be the most. Okay, another question just came in from Kent B. Would you characterize the resistance to the geological thinking of the Ice Age floods as similar to the resistance to that of plate tectonics idea? Yes, very, yeah, very, very good question. Uh, very similar kinds of things because as I was a uh, graduate student uh, in the 1960s, well, actually as an undergraduate student, uh, I took uh, some historical geology class and they said, well, you know, there's uh, we got these dinosaurs and they're uh, very separated. You know, we got the Atlantic Ocean and uh, we're not sure how they got there. And, and there was something about uh, land bridges that would come up and well, then I asked the question, well, where are the land bridges? Well, they sunk. And so it was kind of, we didn't have answers to things. And so uh, when it first came in, there were people arguing uh, that no, uh, uh, everything's been where it's at, the continents, the ocean basins, uh, nothing's changed. And uh, again, uh, building of evidence, uh, looking at uh, uh, the, the uh, ocean basins, for example, and we found that uh, most of the rocks were, and sediments were very young. Uh, the oldest went back about 150 million years uh, but most, uh, most of just a few million, could be a few million years old. So once we started looking at the ocean basins, uh, it became evident uh, that things were going uh, quite different. So again, it was a, a matter of building up uh, a lot of information. Uh, we had uh, uh, paleomagnetism uh, that uh, indicated the things that uh, have magnetic signatures that says that uh, they originated near the equator and now they're up at, uh, well, they're in the North Cascades of Washington state. So yeah, uh, same, same kind of thing. Uh, uh, maybe not, it didn't take uh, 40 years or 30 or 40 years to accept it, but uh, uh, it was a major, major development, yes. Dr. Kiever, one of the things I think is fascinating about the story is when Bretz came out with his theory, um, he was really the outlier. I mean, all of the other scientists were stacked up against him. It was like there was a consensus that this could not be true, but yet it was true and it was solved by field work. And uh, it's just uh, interesting how science works, works itself out, that over time the truth does come out, but initially there's a lot of resistance. Very much so, and um, uh, yeah, but you do have to have that evidence. So uh, again, I think uh, 
one of the problems was that the people who were up against him were some of the uh, big names in geology. And so there were other folks who were not the big names and they said, well, you know, they had some suspicion, maybe, maybe there's some truth in it. But uh, uh, when he had uh, uh, some of those big names, Galuli and others, uh, that um, uh, kind of uh, quelched, uh, squelched some of the uh, uh, opposition. A comment from Kent B to everyone, change is hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and perhaps just a little bit uh, uh, kind of independent himself. And so he realized that he needed to know where that water came from. And he actually spent part of one summer uh, looking uh, in uh, northeastern Washington he said, well, maybe there's some young volcanic rocks. And what he wanted to find was some volcanic eruption took place under a glacier. And just like in Iceland, we get uh, what they call yokelops. And so uh, this happens frequently. They'll get a volcanic eruption under the glacier. Lots of water is generated. And you get some flood uh, racing uh, out from the uh, edge of the glacier. And so he kind of looked at that and then he finally got to the point. He said, well, I've proven that uh, there's a flood went through here. You find the water. <laughs> I have a question. Back back then there were there were discussions that perhaps the, the floodwaters found a path into Willapa or Grace Harbor. Is that not uh, not a fact or not substantiated? No, it's not uh, substantiated. In fact, uh, uh, it appears that it came gushing out onto the uh, Astoria fan. Uh, so right off uh, Astoria going out into the coast. And once that happens, then you dump all this sediment, high energy water, bringing it in, and you generate uh, what we call density currents or turbidity currents. And these are uh, currents that will flow uh, great distances. They're, they're practically frictionless. And so they go out onto the uh, oceanic plain and they're found off of, uh, uh, in the, the Scaba trough off of uh, Northern California. And so, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, nothing, nothing happened on the Oregon coast with the, with the flood water. The, uh, lavas got there, and so uh, uh, Columbia River basalts are found. In fact, all that great scenery in northern Oregon that, that you see, uh, you're looking at the Columbia River basalt, all those rocks sticking up and, and so forth. So, uh, yeah, it's strange. You go to the Oregon coast, and you say, well, I'm still on Columbia River basalt. This is crazy. <laughs> Well, thank you, Dr. Kiever. Uh, we learned a lot tonight. Uh, your presentation was really rich with a lot of new information about the exciting Ice Age flood story. And uh, just wanted to remind those on the uh, Zoom call tonight that this presentation was recorded. If you want to go back and watch it again, it'll be available out on our YouTube channel. You just uh, uh, go in and enter uh, youtube.com uh, and um, uh, search for the uh, for uh, Ice Age floods dash Cheney dash Spokane, and uh, you can see this presentation as many times as you want to, and share it share it with your friends. Also, wanted to mention that uh, as Dr. Kieber had mentioned, Dr. Linda uh, McCollum will be speaking uh, via a Zoom uh, presentation on April the twentieth. That's a Tuesday night. Uh, on the mega floods formation of Scour Lakes located at the head of the Cheney Scrabland, uh, Scabland Tract. So uh, watch that, uh, uh, plan to join us with that uh, presentation as well. Uh, and uh, please do uh, visit frequently the Ice Age Floods Institute website at www.iafi.org for information on membership, the flood story, 
uh, events offered by uh, chapters and uh, uh, throughout the region uh, that are affiliated with the Ice Age Floods Institute and much, much more. We thank you very much for joining us tonight. And again, thank you, Dr. Kiever.